Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar. Today's topic is private equity investment in gastroenterology 2.0. A few things to keep in mind throughout the presentation. All attendee lines are muted. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions. You can ask the questions by typing within the Q&A section located in the control bar, which is most likely at the top or bottom of your screen. This webinar will be recorded and it will be distributed within a few business days. Today's speakers include Steve McFeeters, shareholder at Maynard Cooper, and Abe Emboge, who is a senior associate at Provident Healthcare Partners. I will now turn it over to Abe to give a brief introduction on Provident. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining today. Again, Abe Emboge from Provident Healthcare Partners. Uh, just a little bit of background on our firm. Uh, we're a healthcare focused investment banking firm, have been around for about 20 years in the lower middle market of healthcare working on transactions anywhere from $10 million on the low end all the way up to half a billion dollars on, on the higher end. Um, we've carved out a ninth in the segment and have closed several transactions in, in, in multi-site physician practice management-based transactions. Uh, most recently, we represented Southeast Gastro through their uh, acquisition by Gastro Health, a portfolio company of Audax Group, which was the first private equity platform in, in gastroenterology. But we've done deals in a number of, of different verticals of practice management, all of the ologies, um, orthopedics, pain management, dermatology, ophthalmology, dental, have a couple other of our uh, relevant physician transactions listed here in, in the bottom right as well. But we're about 23 investment banking professionals headquartered in Boston with another office in Los Angeles, which is where I'm based. And so moving on, I'll turn it over to Steve, and he'll give you a little bit of background on Maynard Cooper. Thank you. Uh, Steve McFeeders, I'm a shareholder at Maynard Cooper. Uh, we're a firm that's headquartered in Birmingham, but have eight offices around the country, two in California, San Francisco and Los Angeles, uh, Washington, D.C., New York, and then four in Alabama. We have uh, over 275 attorneys, uh, 30, more than 35 of which are actually specialized in healthcare uh, and work in that uh, with our healthcare clients uh, day in and day out. We, uh, we've closed and handled over 100 MA transactions for physician practice groups specifically. We've also been on the, the hospital and health system side and also on the private equity side in transactions involving physician practice groups. Um, um, I'm the co-chair of the uh, M&A practice group and also the physician practice integration group uh, as well. And with that, I'll, I'll move along, Abe. Great. So just to set a little context for, for the webinar here today, this is actually the second webinar we've done on private equity investment into the gastroenterology specialty. Um, the first one we did was in September of 2017. And Really, at the time, uh, Gastro Health was the only um, platform within the space as they had done their deal with, with Audax Group in, in the first quarter of 2016. Um, since then, the, the market has developed pretty substantially. Gastro Health has expanded significantly across the state of Florida, um, as well as into the state of Alabama. Several other platforms have been formed in Texas Digestive Disease Consultants' partnership with Wad Capital and Fraser Healthcare Partners' partnership with Atlanta Gastroenterology as well as the formation of U.S. Digestive Health in Pennsylvania in, in conjunction with Amulet Capital. Um, and so the market has really developed. So we thought it made sense to, to put together another webinar where we, we'd kind of cover the updated activity and you can kind of see um, how the, you know, what the state of the market is today. And so if you look here at the, the bottom left corner, um, you, you can see the, the current platforms that have all been formed, the GI Alliance, which formerly te Texas Digestive Disease Consultants, Gastro Health, which was the first platform, United Digestive, which was built off of Atlantic Gastroenterology Associates, and U.S. Digestive Health, which was formed as a, com conjunct a combination of three groups with Am Amulet Capital. And all of these blue circles represent confirmed transactions that are on the market or are currently going on um, around the country. So you can see there, there's just a lot of activity in the gastroenterology space as, as it currently stands today. Um, and a lot of this activity is going to be new private equity platforms coming to the space, as well as uh, expansion opportunities for some of these existing platforms to move into new markets, similar to what Gastro Health had, had done with, with Southeast Gastro. Uh, and if you look at the timeline here on the, the right, this is just a, a kind of a timeline of 
of the, the private equity investment and consolidation within gastroenterology beginning in, in March with, with Gastro Health and, and Audax Group. And you can see it's color, color coded to show that it's a platform investment. Um, and then the, these light, light blue uh, boxes here represent outer acquisitions that Gastro Health made into um, other areas with, within Florida. And you can see that they, they rapidly expanded all the way through 2018 and are continuing to do so. But what's interesting now is you starting to, you're starting to see other platform investments come into the market. So uh, Wad Capital and Texas Digestive Disease Consultants, Fraser and Atlanta Gastro, um, as well as some regional platforms being created as well. So Covenant Surgical Partners has been active in, in creating new regional platforms around the country and with Anne Arundel Gastroenterology Associates, as well as uh, most recently the Arizona Centers for Digestive Health, uh, and, and obviously the most recent private equity platform being U.S. Digestive Health in conjunction with Amulet Capital. So what our expectation around this is, is that, one, with all these transactions that are going on, you're going you're to continue to see a lot of activity within gastroenterology. But two, as you can see, there are a lot of new platforms out there being created, and, and these platforms are going to go out and expand. They're all relatively sizable groups. And so when you think about you know, gastro health and then a flurry of add-on acquisitions following behind it in 2017 and 2018, we expect that number to, to ramp up significantly as these existing platforms continue to expand. And so next, moving on to the next slide, we'll, we'll kind of compare this to what we've seen in other specialties. So here you can, you can see uh, sort of private equity investment across the different sectors of physician services. And, and, and you know, the, the, the focus of our previous webinar on private equity investment in gastroenterology was, was you know, the impending um, consolidation led by private equity of, of the sector. And, and really where that, where that comes from is a lot of these other segments of, of practice management and physician services, you know, groups and, and private equity firms have seen a lot of success investing in, in building large, you know, best-in-class organizations within those spaces. And so the idea is that, you know, they want to replicate the success that they've seen in those specialties such as ophthalmology or dermatology or, or pain management or, or dental uh, in other multi-site physician-based uh, practice management specialties, gastroenterology, urology, OBGYN, and orthopedics being some of the, some of the newer specialties that are seeing consolidation. Um, even if you just looked at these four specialties at the bottom, say two years ago, each of them had one, maybe two uh, private equity platforms in the space. As you can see now, uh, you know, four for gastroenterology, three for urology, four for OBGYN, and, and five in, in the orthopedic space. And so what we've tend to, tended to see in, in other specialties, um, such as ophthalmology, is the, the number of platforms ramps up pretty quickly. So if you look at ophthalmology, the, the first deal was in 2014, Claris Vision with Candescent Partners. Fast forward to today, uh, you know, five years later, there's roughly 22 private equity platforms in the space. That number stayed at about one or two uh, from 2014 all the way until the third quarter or so of 2016, where that's where you saw a rapid expansion in all of the platforms that entered the market. And so we really expect a very similar thing uh, to happen in gastroenterology, where you're going to see as you, you saw on the last slide, some of those transactions will come to a close and, and be completed and increase the amount of platforms in the space, as well as be out on acquisitions for existing platforms. So we would anticipate you see this, this number increase from four pretty substantially in the next 18 months or so. Uh, I don't think you'll see 22 platforms in gastroenterology. It's just not as fragmented as, as ophthalmology is, and there's a, a lot more groups out there. But I think you'll probably see somewhere in the 9 to 12 uh, range in terms of, of private equity platforms that are actively out there consolidating the market. And so moving on to the next slide, you know, what are the strategic options that are available to gastroenterology practices? And, and we think of them in, in, in kind of four buckets here. So uh, option one being full independence, kind of status quo, exactly the way things are being done today, um, really no, no change. Option two being being private equity. So you know, going out and, and raising capital in either a minority or, or majority equity investment with the idea that you're going to leverage the capital and expertise of your partner to then go out and, and consolidate the market, bring on other add-on acquisitions, and, and grow your platform. At the bottom here, we've just listed out a, a, a few private equity firms that have all expressed an interest in, in gastroenterology, and there are many more um, given the success that they're seeing others have in the market, like GastroHealth and, and Audax Group. Um, option three, you know, private equity-backed organizations. Uh, 
these are groups that are already established in, in the marketplace that um, have already gone out and raised private equity capital. So, you know, these are the established groups as we've, we've discussed, Gastro Health and Audex Group, uh, the GI Alliance, which is, which is Texas Digestive Disease Consultants and WAD Capital, uh, United Digestive, which is Atlanta Gastroenterology Associates and, and Fraser Healthcare Partners, and, and U.S. Digestive Health uh, with Amulet Capital. And so there's an opportunity here to, you know, partner with those groups, and, and a lot of them are very large and, and well-respected gastroenterology organizations that are, you know, um, have a lot of respect to the community and, and, and have a lot of best practices that they can diffuse uh, amongst the, the other providers in the space. And they, they've built out very robust infrastructure and, and have a unique culture. And so there, there's an opportunity to join those organizations and, and benefit from the best practices or in some cases even even rate differentials from, from the, the scale that those organizations already possess uh, when you think about negotiating and creating leverage with payers. Still an opportunity to, to roll over equity into a previous established platform similar to private equity, um, albeit it tends to be a little bit less of a rollover component in, in the private equity backed transactions compared to uh, a pure kind of initial platform investment like option two. And then option four, um, strategic acquirers. So these are, we would, we would bucket these as kind of the large uh, strategic entities that are, are consolidating the physician services and, and uh, you know industry, someone like an Optum or a physician's endoscopy, who's been consolidating the gastroenterology ASC industry for quite a, quite some time. Now getting interested on on the practice side of things or, or surgery partners. So, with those organizations, they're obviously massive organizations, some publicly traded that you know have a lot of a lot of strategic resources and, and very significant scale and, and diverse service lines. And so there's an opportunity for some groups to, to partner with those organizations and, and benefit from that scale. Uh, but really the, the focus of the webinar here today is kind of option two and option three. So moving on to the, to the next slide. You know, comparing a, a private equity platform to a private equity backed partner, uh, I think there's a couple of pros and cons to each, and they're important to consider as, as groups are thinking about these types of transactions and, and which route they want to go or pursue. Uh, I think both provide an, an increased access to capital, which is important as you think about growing in the market, whether you're raising private equity capital yourself or becoming, say, a regional platform for someone like uh, a gas or health moving into a new market. Uh, under a private equity scenario, pure private equity scenario, it was an opportunity to leverage the private equity firm for board level strategic support and and really get 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 that expertise at, at the board level um, and you as the the platform would have an opportunity to sit on that board and, and participate in and often you know physicians will be will be chairing that board as well. Um, all of the in existing infrastructure and systems and, and culture is really based on uh, the initial platform investment, right? The private equity firm is, is making an investment in that organization, um, just like Wad Capital did with Texas Digestive Disease Consultants, because they believe in that infrastructure and the culture of the organization and, and think that, you know, there's a lot of value there to be provided to other groups in, in the market. And so everything is based on the initial platform, and that's a, that's a benefit of being, you know, raising that private equity capital yourself. Uh, and you're 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 joining the organization at the ground at the ground floor. So you know there's a bigger opportunity for equity upside. Whereas if you're joining an established organization, you know they're going to set the share price and the amount of equity that you roll into the organization will will purchase an, a, you know a, a predetermined amount of shares per, prior to closing. But if you're forming the platform, you're kind of you know you you are at the ground floor in terms of the stock price of the organization. Um, some of the cons of becoming a private equity platform. So there is a lot of competition out there in the GI market. It's accelerating. There's there's other platforms being formed. There's currently four today, as well as competition from other strategic acquirers in the market. So there's a lot of groups out there trying to prove that they're the best platform or, or partner of choice for other gastroenterology practices out there in the market. And you know, part of what you're going to have to do as a platform is, is convince other groups that, that you're the right partner for them uh, to, to, to provide value for the organization going forward. Um, tends to be a longer time period to a secondary liquidity event. So for groups that um, you know, raise private equity capital, generally think of it as a four to seven year hold period from, from the private equity firm before um, the private equity firm will often exit to a, another private equity firm. And, and really, 
um, that's a, that's a bit longer of a hold period than what you may see in, in some of the private equity backed scenarios. And and as we mentioned before, everything is built off of your organization. So um, there's there's no immediate best practices or managed management support to leverage. You're, you're kind of building that out as you go uh, and starting with with a lot. Hopefully, you know, a good chunk of those pieces in place. But it's not it's not really an option for all groups to to become a private equity platform because you need a a pretty strong base to start with. And as you think about a private equity joining a private equity backed organization, obviously still you get the increased access to capital. Uh, you get a lot of access to an experienced management team and, and private equity investors as they've perhaps done several acquisitions before. They have strategies that they can implement where you know Gastro Health has grown in, in Florida and executed on several add-on acquisitions down there. Um, they can bring that expertise perhaps to another organization who's trying to expand in their market. So you get pretty quick ex uh, access to experience management and, and the, the private equity teams behind them. Uh, you can create quick leverage with payers. So for an organization like Texas Digestive Disease Consultants, fairly, you know, Fairly, fairly large in the state of Texas, and um, you know has has you know very good contracts with with other payers in the market. Is there an opportunity to to leverage some of those synergies between their organization and your organization if if you were you know say a GI practice in the state of Texas? Um, so so some groups find that very attractive. Um, your rollover equity is diversified. So when you look at Southeast Gastro's transaction with with Gastro Health. You know, now that the equity of, of those shareholders does not just sit in Alabama, but they benefit from the growth of, of that they're going to see in, in Florida through Gastro Health and, and around the country as, as Gastro Health continues to expand, uh, an ability to share best practices both operationally and clinically. You know, the organizations that tend to become platforms have, have very robust uh, best practices in, in place from an operational and clinical perspective, and there's an opportunity to share some of those pretty pretty quickly. And then this is this last point is a big one. So uh, a shorter time frame to a secondary deal. So as we mentioned on the private equity platform side, you're you're taking all that risk on the front end, and you're you know perhaps going to have a longer time frame to to an exit, but you may see more of the upside. Where some groups see a benefit in partnering with an established platform is that it's a group that's already been doing this for maybe a year or two, and they're they're you know part of the way into their investment. And so, is there an opportunity for us to get in on on kind of the the upswing of the organization, and, and maybe it's instead of four to seven years into an exit, maybe it's three to five or, or two to four or a shorter time frame, and there's a lot more certainty around there going to be another exit because a group has already been successfully executing on their strategy. So that, that's a big motivator for groups as well. Um, some of the cons, obviously, from an autonomy perspective, you're joining another organization, so there is a, bit, a bit of limited opportunity to have board-level re representation and voting power. There's an existing management team and infrastructure in place, so they, they tend to look for synergies where applicable. Um, and then the equity could be highly priced depending on where that 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 platform is at in the life cycle of the, the PE investment. Uh, if you join earlier, you know you're going to have a, a share price that's probably closer to what the original platform had when, when they built it out. If you join later. There's obviously been a lot of growth since the initial platform investment, and so the, the share price of the organization may be higher. And so moving on, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, what are the qualities of an, a, an attractive GI platform? And I think they're, they're pretty similar to what you see in a lot of other practice management specialties. Really kind of low co revenue concentration risk, a, a diverse base of service lines, you know, strong management team. Have they put the the investments necessary into the infrastructure of the business so that it can really support future growth? Do they have centralized billing, finance, IT, HR functions, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and really, the, the whole idea behind a, a GI platform is, is your organization, um, does it have the infrastructure necessary to provide value to smaller groups that are in and around your market or around the country? Because the idea is that your infrastructure can be leveraged to take some of the burden that you know, smaller organizations out there in the market are, are feeling as, as they've had to make incremental investments into their IT and infrastructure as well. Um, if that can be centrally managed by a larger platform, you can create a lot of value for a lot of those groups. So, you know, private equity firms want to partner with groups that, that have a lot of these, these pieces in place or as much as possible on the front end so they can use that to leverage and accelerate the growth of the organization. And as you think about platforms, we tend to talk in, in terms of a, a pure private equity platform, but you can be a platform for an established group as, as well. You know, the, you look at 
Gas for Health transaction with, with Southeast Gastro that brought them out of the state of Florida. Southeast Gastro is very much a, a platform for Gas for Health in that um, they're, they have a lot of these things in place and will be leveraging them to expand within the state of Alabama because Gas for Health can't manage everything from, from, from Florida and Alabama. And so um, is there an opportunity for, for groups to be regional platforms as well? And, and there absolutely is. And so moving on, we'll talk a little bit about some of the transaction considerations for, for groups. Um, and these are all things you want to consider kind of ahead of going to market. You know, what, what, are, what are the type of transaction that would best satisfy the shareholder motivations, whether that's private equity or strategic? Uh, what are the growth objectives of the organization? W what are the growth avenues that are available? Are there additional ASCs that could be launched? Um, is there an opportunity to do joint ventures with some health system partners in the local market that could provide some, some strategic leverage with, with payers? Uh, what kind of infrastructure does the organization have and, and what can be leveraged as we talk about expanding as a platform? Uh, what, what, what kind of time horizon do the shareholders have? You know, are they thinking they'd like a, a quicker kind of transaction with a private equity backed partner where there's more certainty towards a, a secondary liquidity event or you know, do they have a longer time horizon in that they'd like to try to be, be a platform and, and grow the organization from, from the ground floor? Uh, what's the strength of the current management team? Is there additional bandwidth or capacity to undertake further expansion of the organization? And, and really, what's the risk tolerance of the organization? How many chips would the shareholders like to take off? And you know, does it make sense to, to really take a sizable piece of equity going forward and, and really participate in the upside of the transaction um, as well as the initial liquidity event? And so moving on. Preparing for a transaction process. So as you think about going out and exploring a transaction, there are a couple, kind of three buckets is, is how we think about it in terms of what you need to consider from an organizational perspective. Uh, the first being strategic. So uh, again, what, what are the key growth opportunities available to the organization that are attractive to an investor? Uh, this is something we help all of our clients think about just because maybe they haven't thought of it in, in this light before. But you know, where is the organization capable of expanding? How fast can it can it expand? Are there uh, other partnership opportunities in the market that if you had a capital partner behind you would be willing to join your, your platform? Uh, is there another market that's perhaps underserved and, and you, you think it would make sense to put an ASC in there? Those are all things you want to think about and, and, and be able to talk intelligently about before going to the investor community. Um, are all of the shareholders on board for a transaction? We spend a lot of our time working with our clients on education of, of the shareholder base and making sure that they have all of the answers to, to questions and, and so that that allows them to arrive at an educated decision whether a transaction makes sense or, or not for them. I think it's very important that, that groups have all the answers to their questions so they can, they can ha make an informed decision. Um, are all the stakeholders on board, so both associate physicians and, and key management members, you know, are they in the in the loop on a on a potential transaction and, and making sure that, um, you know, the, the real revenue generators of, of the business, whether they're shareholder physicians, associate physicians, or, or the management team that's going to be driving the growth going forward, you know, are are they on board and do they under, understand the the strategic vision behind pursuing a transaction? From an operational standpoint. Does the team have the bandwidth to evaluate partners in an orderly and efficient format? It, it, these are very long and, and arduous transaction processes, and so uh, it's important to understand you know, the time commitment that's involved and, and you know, will the group have the bandwidth to pursue it you know, efficiently. Um, and as far as the due diligence side of things from an operational perspective, are the corporate documents, leases, articles of incorporation, payer contracts, are those readily accessible? As you get further down the line in a transaction, you'll get, you're going to need to pull a, a large volume of, of, of corporate documentation, and you want those things to be easily accessible and readily available. As well as from a, a billing perspective, um, can, can the organization pull data at the unit economic level from it, from its EMR system? Um, all of the investors, and, and we help our clients prepare this prior to going to market, but all the investors are going to want to operate those things from a statistical perspective um, prior to making an investment or, or putting forth an offer because they want to understand those trends of the business. And then from a financial perspective, you know, are the are the financials organized appropriately? Typically, with GI transactions, you know, there's a lot of entities involved. You have surgery center entities, anesthesia entities. Sometimes PATH is separated out, uh, infusion, uh, different locations, the practice, and so um, all those things. Want to you want to have them rolling up into one consolidated financial statement that that everyone can can quickly kind of grasp and, and get a feel for uh, the financials of the organization, and that allows them to evaluate the trends and and so on. Um, and, and have an educated view of what the practice looks like from a financial perspective. 
and what are the key addbacks and adjustments that need to be made. Really, the biggest adjustment is a compensation adjustment in terms of how much compensation are we are we selling down? Are we are we selling down too much compensation to create the adjusted EBITDA for the business? Um, and figuring out what that right level of go forward compensation is, is really uh, um, something we spend a lot of time with our clients with to make sure we're not selling down too much and 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 we have an, enough to continue to be incentivized post closing and and still enough that it creates a, enough of an EBITDA base that creates a, a an economically viable transaction. And then what will be the impact of converting from cash basis to a, uh, to accrual accounting? All the transactions that you see, you're see you seeing done are done on an accrual basis. And so uh, working through what the impact of that can be going from a, a currently a, a cash basis, which most groups are on a cash basis to accrual, is important specifically as you think about uh, in GI and fusion. So in fusion is a lot of groups out there are – paying the expenses on their drugs, and, and there's a big impact on the accrual basis when you switch. So it's important to think through some of those things before going to market. And so with all that said, we'll pass it over to, to Maynard Cooper and Steve to, to talk through some of the regulatory and legal side of things with, with the GI transaction. Thanks, Abe. Kind of uh, dovetailing off your, your last slide, once you've kind of looked at the strategic and the operational and financial considerations, uh, and decided, hey, uh, we think this is something as a group uh, or a practice we want to do, uh, it's important that you prepare for the sale transaction. Um, you know, the first aspect, which you know, oftentimes when a group comes to us, uh, they may have already engaged uh, an investment banker or financial advisor. They typically have a, a CPA and accounting firm that they work with uh, regularly. And then obviously getting legal who's experienced in the, the type of transactions. Uh, so, so once you've engaged your advisors, uh, you, you need to kind of – due diligence is kind of the initial kickoff where the buyer or potential buyer will uh, kind of kick the tires of the seller, so to speak. Uh, and PE firms conduct broad and exhaustive due diligence. They have duties to the people who invest in their funds. Uh, so, you know, one of the key components there is the financial component. Uh, that would be something that, that you know, it, it, as far as like in the Southeast Gastro deal, we work with Provident on that one. They they handled the financial uh, due diligence and worked with the uh, the buyer there to, to make sure that they had everything they need. Uh, one of the big aspects of the financial due diligence is a quality of earnings report uh, that, that usually a third party does for the uh, – for the for the buyer, uh, and that's an important aspect. Uh, there's also some key non-financial areas of focus. Uh, kind of general corporate. Do you have your corporate house in order? Organizational documents like articles and bylaws. Uh, if you're a corporation, a shareholders agreement. If you're an LLC, an operating agreement. Um, do you have affiliates and subsidiaries? You know, we come across clients who may have a number of different affiliates and subsidiaries and and sometimes they're not sure uh at the time we first meet with them who, who has ownership of what so kind of getting their org chart in order so we understand who owns what who, and then there may be some who aren't with the practice who may have a minority ownership in some of the businesses so understanding the whole corporate landscape is extremely important uh, a big topic in healthcare uh, and, and in private equity transactions is obviously compliance with laws um, the first place you start with there is billing and coding. Uh, you know, this is something that in the healthcare space, obviously, there's uh, been a lot of uh, billing and coding uh, discussion and, and issues. And, and even if you're a just a, a very competent and, and do a good job of uh, trying to be compliant, there's so many laws and there's so many areas to have foot faults that it, it's hard to to manage that. Um, so they'll come in and look, you know, one of the ways is to get this kind of in order on the, at inception is to, you, you, do you conduct it? This sometimes depends on the size of the group. You got to have the manpower. This would be sort of a platform company as Abe talked about, rather than maybe a, a smaller group who doesn't have all the resources, but a number of larger groups may, they may conduct internal audits on their own, their own people auditing their own work. Uh, they may have extensive training and regular training and then, you know, compliance plans in place. And, and most, a lot of groups, even smaller ones, have compliance plans in place. And I think the, the main takeaway on those is to make sure you're actually following your plan. Uh, 
uh, one big mistake we see is people have all the written documentation and compliance plans in place, but yet they haven't really taken any actions related to that plan. So they spent a lot of time to put it together and then it just kind of sat on a shelf. Uh, they're also going to have third party audits from, from governmental payers like Medicare and Medicaid and then non-governmental payers as well. To the extent you have those and they're in good shape and and you've had people come in and, and you can share the results of those, that's a, a good thing to be able to share to show your compliance. Uh, there's there's DHS compensation or designated health services. Uh, you need to make sure that you're, uh, uh, you know, for any DHS uh, revenues that those are, are, are treated appropriately and uh, that those monies, you know, oftentimes you'll see a group that maybe uh, a productivity driven group that will take the DHS services and put them in a, a separate bucket and, and divide them differently than they would based on productivity to make sure they're in compliance uh, with the healthcare laws. Uh, you know, HIPAA privacy security, you see those, that's, that's another hot button that you see a lot of. You got to have your business associate agreements in place. You need to make sure, and, there's, and the one thing is often to consider is your state law equivalent. Some states have actually broader laws than uh, than HIPAA uh, so, and, and others may not have a state law equivalent at all. So um, contracts, relationships with other providers, hospitals, um, you know, ASCs, any, other doctors, those kinds of things, those will have higher scrutiny because you're dealing with a healthcare provider. And you want to make sure those contracts are in place and that they're compliant as well. You know, real property leases, fair market value, that's important for two reasons. If it's a if it's a landlord uh, who is uh, affiliated, you know, you want to make sure you have an arm's length transaction there because when the buyer comes in and, and if it happens to be another provider, it needs to be fair market value to be compliant. Uh, marketing activities and they're obviously look at your pending and threatened litigation. Uh, so, mo so moving on to the next slide. HR employee benefits, uh, they'll look at your benefit plans. Uh, you know, this will, can, we'll get to the structure of the transaction in, in a little bit, but, uh, you know, 401k plans, those are easy to freeze and terminate if necessary as part of a transaction. Cash balance plans, um, you know, on, on the other end of the, uh, of the spectrum are, are difficult and time consuming to terminate uh, and, and complete. So you, PTO policies, sometimes we've seen groups who have a very liberal PTO policy. Well, private equity firm will, will not like to see that. They'll like to see something that's, uh, so those are the kinds of things that you take. You severance, what's your policy on severance? Do you have an employee handbook? Do you follow it? Um, you know, they, there's some labor laws, uh, the exempt, non-exempt for overtime purposes. Have you been in compliance with those? And then insurance as well. Uh, remedying the existing practice issues and problems. One of the things I see often is a group not often, but, but but with some regularity is a group will look to do a transaction because they want to solve an internal problem that they really haven't been willing to address or haven't, you know, just because it's not fun to address a lot of the issues in a practice. Um, you know, those kind of things that I, I will say I've found that those tend to be exacerbated when you try to do a transaction, not, not fixed. So uh, it, it comes to a head when you do a transaction. So it's important, I think, to remedy those kinds of issues before you would go to market, uh, because otherwise that's going to be something that's going to be a focus of the of the, the buyer. Uh, your leadership, uh, are you a group versus individual type firm? You know, uh, we see some that are all about the group, and others that are you know pretty much individual positions. You know, th they work together, but they're not. They don't view themselves as a, as a real cohesive group. I think those are kinds of issues that may relate to whether you're you're able to be a platform uh, practice or whether you're better just to be a, be a bit add-on. Um, restrictive covenants, uh, sometimes those are in place or not in place. Do you have them? Because I think if you have them, when, when a private equity firm asks you for them, they'll be more, uh, you know, they'll be more known to you. Uh, retirement, this is a big, big issue because, you know, the Private equity firm, when they come in and acquire uh, and, and kind of partner with a uh, with a practice, they're looking for those doctors, and those doctors are kind of you know they generate the money for the practice. Uh, so they want to make sure that they're going to stick around and they're everybody's fully engaged. Now, does that mean there's no retirement? No, but they do. You will see 
guardrails, I think it's important in preparing for this is that uh, folks at the practice are are in it for uh, you know they're not, they're not looking at this as an exit to kind of take a take a break. They're actually in this to to kind of grow their practice and see it move to the next level. Um, so retirement, you'll see things around retirement like you know maybe if you have a five year initial term, maybe you can't uh, retire until a certain amount of time. No, no physician in that group can retire until a certain amount of time within uh, you know, the first five years or the first two years, and then you have to give a certain amount of notice, usually 12 months notice may be uh, appropriate. And then maybe you can only have one physician kind of working out their notice at a time. Uh, so you can plan around it, uh, but uh, but it's important to, to be on, because what, what a lot of groups have is when they hear the retirement, uh, a lot of guys are like, I'm not sure if I'm gonna retire. Well, they need to. You need to have an honest and open communication about that beforehand, and then also to the extent you do have folks that will retire within the first five years or so, uh, you will want to have a, a open dialogue with the private equity firm. And then compensation plans. I see groups with all different kinds of compensation plans. A lot of times, there's an opportunity to continue your compensation plan, uh, especially if you're a platform acquisition. And then the last thing is you just. You, we have, you know, your lawyers will have sample due diligence information requests. I think it's always helpful to go through those and, and make sure you have all those things. Abe was mentioning kind of getting your house in order uh, or earlier so that you have access to those things. We'll, we can do that through a pretty good idea of what they're going to request. Moving to the next page, uh, when we're talking about the transaction specifically, you know, we're going to touch on a number of things. First, you've got sell side, it's a competitive process. Uh, you're selecting a buyer and a partner. Now, they'll have limited buy side diligence. Typically, uh, you, you, uh, Provident, your, your uh, investment bank will prepare a confidential information memorandum that will have a lot of the key financial metrics and other uh, just uh, other important aspects of of the of the buy of the seller, so that you know potential buyers can get a good idea whether they have an interest or not. Uh, on the sell side, you may have some limited due diligence, and, and oftentimes your your investment banker and provident will will know the parties and have an experience with those parties and can tell you kind of uh, what their what their DNA is as far as on, on what their deals are and how they are to work with. Uh, the, the first part, typically, once you've decided on who you want to partner with, and and is to negotiate a letter of intent. It sets forth kind of the key deal points, price, uh, rollover equity, um, you know, those kind of things, what the structure is going to be. We'll talk about that on a future slide. And one of the big considerations at the letter of intent stage is what level of detail do you go into? It's non-binding, but I think to the extent you hit issues and there's not a substantial change by the time you, you sign the letter of intent, then you go through the due diligence process and then you document this and in contracts, a purchase agreement, and, and whatnot, uh, to the extent things really haven't changed, those points, although not binding, uh, kind of do set the tone for those issues. Uh, so you'll see letters of intent that are two or three pages long, and you'll see others, and often in private equity transactions, you'll see others that are longer with maybe an exhibit that sets forth real specific details for certain provisions of the, of the various contracts. Uh, then you'll have what we talked about earlier, comprehensive due diligence. You're preparing for that. You've got financial and then the non-financial we talked about on our prior slide. Um, then you would no negotiate and document your transaction agreements. You know, your key, key document is typically the purchase agreement. Uh, you have employment agreements. You, you have a governance, governance agreement. Sometimes that's an exhibit to the employment agreement. Sometimes it's a standalone document. Uh, an escrow agreement, you know, typical, they'll, some amount of the purchase price may be held back, and we'll talk about that, and then any other uh, agreements related to the transaction. And then you've kind of got your closing and timeline. Yeah, I think it's important to set a, a reasonable but aggressive timeline. I think that keeps the parties motivated and, and gives you greater success at uh, executing on the deal. Uh, you don't want to have big gaps. Uh, there's there's a various things, and you, private equity firms are very good at uh, you know, experience with uh, you kind of layering these on top of each other so that they start them on time and you can have multiple work streams going at one time. Moving to the next slide, 
kind of we, we look at the the physician practice private equity transactions sort of as a the three legs of the stool if you will uh one is sort of the sale of your practice and the you know the, the investment and the buyer the rollover equity that you get uh, the second is sort of the, the employment relationship, kind of closing going forward. Uh, and the third is, you know, the, the governance of your practice post-closing. Um, you know, one of the key things there is just to try to, uh, as much as possible, m mimic, at least on a day-to-day operational basis, uh, so that it doesn't feel like a huge change. Uh, and the private equity firm, you know, kind of comes alongside and adds resources and and but you, you see that as a as a positive and not as a negative. Uh, moving to the next slide. Uh, so the first leg is the sale of the practice, and the first th thing you need to figure out is the structure of your transaction. You know you can sell the assets of your company, you can sell the equity of your company. Uh, typically, you know in, in private equity deals, we see a lot of equity purchases. Uh, but we've also seen a, a number of asset purchases too. Typically, you, you know, as a general rule, you'll see sellers prefer to sell equity, although not always, and, and buyers like to, like to buy assets, but again, not always. Uh, the type of practice entity that you are, uh, you can be a professional corporation, a limited liability company, a professional limited liability company. Uh, the key to remember there is if you're a professional corporation or professional limited liability company, your permissible owners are only professionals. So for able to do an equity purchase, you would need to convert uh, to another entity immediately prior to closing, which is we've done a number of deals and is, is not a difficult thing to do. Uh, the tax implications can be different depending on whether you're doing a sale of equity or a sale of assets. Uh, you know, generally speaking, it's a sale of equity. Uh, you know, I think from a sell side perspective, you think you're going to have better uh, tax consequences and, and, and a buyer may believe that you know, if they buy the assets, they can achieve some tax uh, tax benefits there as well. So uh, the other thing to consider is your contracts, your leases, permits, and licenses are much easier to transfer without any additional work in an equity sale. So that's one of the considerations that may be taken into account in addition to tax implications. And then in some states, you have uh, the corporate practice of medicine uh, laws on the books and, and in those states you'll need to make sure that you you know it's not in every state but you'll need to make sure that you've uh, paid attention to those and and figured out a model that works for that state and so you can be compliant um, the next item is purchase price that's something that uh, it was a multiple usually of uh, uh, EBITDA uh, and then there's buckets of that as well. You'll have the, the closing cash purchase price. You'll have purchase price that's used to uh, uh, obtain the rollover equity. And then you know some offshoots that you need to just be aware of is the net working capital requirement is, is typical in these transactions. And really that's to ensure that when the buyer takes over the business, there's enough uh, current current assets in the business to allow the buyer to kind of operate if they've just paid you know, a, a large sum of money for a practice, the last thing they want to do is, is a month in, have to inject more capital right away. So that's a, a, a con almost always included in, in a common uh, is to deliver a certain amount of net working capital so they can run the business. And then often part of the purchase price is escrowed, either for the net working capital uh, reconciliation, which usually is a 90 to 100 day pr process post closing but they also have one that's typically 12 to 18 months related to any kind of a indemnity or a claim for losses that may result from pre-closing activities. Uh, so that's something to always keep in, keep in mind is that there, there typically is some portion that's escrowed, you know, maybe five to 10% of the purchase price for, for 12 to 18 months. And then the rollover equity, um, you know, when you, as, as Abe mentioned earlier, Kind of, if you come in as part of the platform, you may get on the same terms uh, as the investor, as a private equity firm. I mean, you get certain preferences and um, maybe a different, you get a better valuation because you're on the front end. But uh, those are important to understand those and to look at those. And, and you know, here's kind of the second bite. We see groups that are really motivated by the second bite and some that are more motivated by the initial transaction. But I think it's important. 
as a partner with a private equity firm to realize that, you know, your second bite as a physician practice will be their first bite. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, moving on to the next page. We, the second is about post-closing employment. So your employment relationship going forward is obviously very important. The compensation, um, we have seen a number of different ways that's dealt with. Often it is, it is some percentage of your net collections, uh, and that can be funded through a group compensation plan. If you have, you know, we've had groups of 20, 30 doctors who uh, have, have their money come in based on collections, but then it's, uh, they do have a compensation plan that talks about how to divide that. So the buyer will fund the, or the, the company will fund uh, the money for the plan and then the doctors have their plan as to how it's, you know, obviously they'll have to get uh, feedback and uh, discussion with their private equity partner on that, but that's an opportunity to kind of mimic private practice to some degree. Uh, we see all different kinds of, pro of of compensation models. Some are equal split, some are productivity models. Um, you know, depending on, I think if, it, if it's been working and the practice has been successful, that's something you might want to continue. That also gives you an opportunity to maybe uh, put some tweaks in. Uh, benefits, health, retirement plans, vacations, CME are all dealt with there. Um, term, a typical term we, we see in employment is five years. And, and sometimes that's almost a five year, sort of what I call a no cut deal. Uh, meaning that you kind of agreed for five years, we're going to, we're going to stay together. There may be some exceptions to that and there may be some consequences to those exceptions. Uh, on the employer section, uh, that would be, you know, if, if the employer terminates without cause, so the employer volu voluntary terminates, you know, that's one way there may be some notice periods there may be some severance that relates to that depending on what the reason for the termination is uh, but that's all negotiable and i've seen it kind of fall out in, in a number of different ways uh, depending on the private equity firm for cause uh, you will always see for cause events that if if those things happen like you no longer can practice you know, for medicaid or you, lo you lose your license or you know you put done something willful and, and intentional, reckless, those kinds of behaviors, been convicted of a felony, that those kinds of things can, can call, re, lead to a for cause termination, which also may have certain adverse uh, effects on you, which, including, you know, an ability to, to buy back your, your rollover equity, um, maybe for either the, the, the amount you paid for it without any upside, but that's all, also negotiated. Uh, on the employee side, you can, without cause, typically there's, there's restrictive covenants. If you voluntarily terminate during the, during the, the term, there's also can be financial penalties. If you don't give the right notice period, there, there can be financial penalties or, or what we call a clawback because the private equity firm views it as they're not getting the benefit of their bargain. Um, retirement is, is we talked about earlier. Again, that's always an important one, uh, because, I think a lot of doctors just say, well, I don't like, you know, I don't, I'm kind of locked in for five years and, and it's just something they haven't really thought about. But oftentimes we find that in their own governing documents, they had a year notice period and, and, and much like the private equity firm may require, they had it in their own documents. They just weren't aware of it. Um, so that's another thing we find out in due diligence. So, and then the last death or disability, which, which is a, always addressed. And then, you know, finally on here, it's the connection between um, between termination employment and liquidated damages, uh, which I mentioned there may be some financial penalties that are already preset in the contract that if, if you do this, then here's the result of that. So that way everybody's on the nose going into it, what the consequences could be. Uh, moving to the next page, uh, restrictive covenants. Uh, the, these are common non-competition. There's two types. Uh, one ancillary is to kind of selling your practice. So that would be more like in the purchase agreement. You know, you, you're, you're an owner of a business and you're selling that. Uh, the time period you see there is often a longer time period. It's five years, but it typically runs from the date you close until the fifth anniversary. So there's not kind of a tail there, which we'll see in a minute as employment. Uh, the restrictive activities, uh, what you can and cannot do, the geography, what what area can you can't you do it in, uh, those all may have some 
difference depending on state law. Uh, the other one is ancillary to your employment relationship. This would usually be in your employment agreement. Uh, it, it's often the time period you're employed plus a uh, one to two year period after that. Uh, restrictive activities and geography, kind of the same as above. You may have uh, certain carve outs if you're, you know, you terminate for good reason or, or those kinds of things. Um, you know, one of the main things a private equity firm is trying to do in a, transa in a transaction is to create uh, kind of a group versus individual or really create glue so that stays together. And, and oftentimes we'll find that we talk to the groups, they're on the same page. I mean, they're, they're moving over and they want to make sure uh, that they have, uh, you know, everybody's kind of in this together and that they don't want to make it easy for somebody to, to leave either because they're looking forward to that next liquidity event as well. So a lot of times you'll, you'll find that the, the position is a group as a group in the private equity firm may be on the same page on some of these issues. Um, Non-solicitation, uh, employees and patients, those are pretty standard. And then, as I mentioned, state law considerations, state by state may have different application. Moving to the next page, talking about the, the, the third leg, uh, the post-closing governance. We've seen this take many different forms. I think the key is is to for the for the groups to understand it uh, and feel comfortable with it. Um, we'll see clinical governance. Obviously, the physicians are going to maintain uh, kind of control over their clinical decisions. I mean, that that can't be delegated to a, a third party. Um, and, and then sometimes we see what we call a clinical governance board, which will have physician members who are elected appointed by the by the physicians themselves. They'll also have non-physician or uh, purchaser members from the private equity firm, so they're on a board working together to to uh, help run the practice. Uh, quality assurance, quality assessment, performance improvement, peer review is typically within the physician's oversight. Although they are often, you know, as is the best, tr the best partnerships are the ones where you have a lot of co consultation and discussion, and and most of the decisions are unanimous. One important part in the governance from the cell side is to kind of manage the day-to-day -day practice operations generally. Uh, and I think, you know, especially for a platform company, one of the things that's interested uh, the private equity firm is your management and, and the kinds of things that you do. You do have, as Abe mentioned, kind of best in class, you're doing things the right way, you have the resources. Uh, but some of the things are scheduling, recruiting, hiring, firing of physicians in advanced practice uh, participants. PTO, vacation, CME, that'll all be uh, call coverage, schedules and policies, and assignment of administrative and supervisor duties of physicians. The key here is uh, even in a uh, governance, you'll have some joint decision making. You'll have consultation rights either by the, the buyer uh, members or the seller members. Uh, and then you know, there'll be some reserve powers that a private equity firm will want to maintain uh, and some that the, the MDs will want to maintain. So I think that's... Uh, that's it on this part. Uh, we, any questions? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, at this time, we'd like to open it up to questions. As a reminder, you can find the Q&A box in the black control panel, which is likely located um, on the, the bottom of your screen. You can just type the questions right in there. Okay, I've got one. It's how do you address the possible retirement of a physician if the group's physician don't have set retirement dates? Again, I think it's likely you'll see an initial five-year term. That's very common or commitment that's requested by the physicians in their employment agreement. Uh, typically, there will not be a prohibition against retirement, just but the limitations like we talked about. Notice periods, maybe 12 months notice. Uh, the number of doctors who can who can be on a notice period at one time may be limited, uh, and then but the group's physician, as we talked about, need to have an open, honest discussion internally to, to determine realistically who actually intends to retire. You know, initial conversations with some groups, they'll have a number of them like, well, I think I might, but the more they talk about it, they realize that they're not planning to retire. So a lot of those times, it works out uh, just by having internal conversations. Uh, in my experience, if the doctors aren't sure they would retire in the next five years, they probably won't. Uh, but if there are some who are going to retire, it's best to have those conversations up front with your private equity 
partner so the parties can plan around actual, not hypothetical retirement plans. Looks like we have another question. Uh, says you, you mentioned that private equity. You mentioned that the, the the number of private equity platforms is expected to increase. How do you expect the existing platforms to interact with each other? It's a good question. I think um, I think if you look at say ophthalmology on that slide, you know there were there were 22 platforms. Um, some several of those are within the same markets. Uh, and, and as you saw with the, the ongoing transactions within GI currently today, um, several of those are ongoing within the, the current markets of a lot of the existing platforms that are already out there. Uh, and the, 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 it's not uncommon to see that in, in other specialties, and, and the reason why is groups are pursuing different strategies. And so, um, you know, some groups are going to pursue a, a very national strategy in terms of trying to expand around the country. Others may pr pursue kind of very regional strategies in terms of trying to create density and and that's going to resonate differently with, with different practices that are in those different markets so um typically i think you know the groups will, will try to compete with each other there will be some competition and that obviously benefits add-on acquisitions as there's there's a competition that increases valuations but um i think you you will see the groups interact but it becomes you know the, the, it creates more options for the groups that are out there in the market looking for um, strategic partners that can help facilitate their growth so I don't anticipate that being a problem in, in terms of the, the selling side of the market. For, for buyers, it obviously increases valuation, so uh, makes it a more attractive market to explore partnerships. It looks like we have another question. When a group is negotiating a letter of intent or a purchase agreement or employment agreement, et cetera, with a private equity buyers representatives, how does that typically work from the physician side, meaning who from the physician group is involved in those discussions? Um, you know, th this is, this is kind of works itself out, but I think that the big thing is if you have a group, you, you don't want too many uh, cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. I think the group should elect representatives who will uh, interface with uh, the investment, the investment bank, the provident, uh, if you, and also with lawyers and accountants just to keep things streamlined. Oftentimes that's the same people in a larger group that are kind of on the, the, the management committee or the board. Uh, typically, I don't, I think this is usually, you know, one or two, maybe, maybe three tops, depending on the size of the group. But I also think the, the buyers will want to have, uh, you know, just be able to deal with one or two people. They won't want to constantly. Now, obviously, those people will report back to the group and there'll be some some group sessions as well. But on a day to day basis, while the transaction is going on, I think it's best to to, to pick your leadership, uh, one or two people and and let them kind of have the power to, to move the transaction along and keep keep the rest of the physicians updated as they go. We have another question here. What's the typical valuation you see in small GI practices, 10 or less physicians compared to larger GI practices, 50 or higher? That's a good question. I think um, it really it, it comes down to the EBITDA um, of the organization. So one of the interesting, interesting things about GI is with the diversity of ancillary services amongst your groups, uh, we've seen you know, 10, 15 GI groups that are, are you know, thrown off Four and a half, five million of adjusted EBITDA, uh, and we've seen larger practices that um, maybe have have sold off a lot of their ancillaries or sold off surgery centers. Maybe you know forty, fifty physicians that are, are throwing off you know a similar amount. Uh, and I think as you think about the valuation multiple that's being paid, um, you may see some uh, some premium for a larger group because of the infrastructure that's required to manage a larger group of fifty, you know, forty, fifty physicians. But um, from an EBITDA standpoint. For groups that are, call it four or five million of adjusted EBITDA, I think it's it's very common to see double digit multiples. Uh, you know, nine or well, nine being single digit, but nine is kind of a floor, and then seeing you know ten, eleven, um, 
uh, 11 times valuations for, for groups that are kind of five plus and adjusted EBITDA. For groups sub five, I think single high single digits is, is, is what we're most commonly seeing, but that's always open to interpretation in terms of, you know, again, it goes back to how many um, how many of those platform characteristics does the group have already in place and what investments have been made? Because the more of that infrastructure, the, the, the more the, the breadth of the ancillary services, the higher the valuation, regardless of, of, of size, whether that's uh, 10 or 50. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, if anyone has any additional questions or if your question wasn't answered, you can reach out directly to the panelists. Their contact information is right on the screen. Um, as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and we will distribute it um, later on this week. Thank you so much everyone for joining and enjoy the rest of your day.